Hey guys, how you doing? Yep, I think so. There we are. So, thank you so much for joining tonight. We're all about email, getting your first 500 newsletter subscribers tonight. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to share with you top tips to how to get your first 500 newsletter subscribers, how to build your list, opt-ins. We're going to look at autoresponders. We're going to look at the whole thing tonight. I want to keep the actual presentation bit short tonight to give you an opportunity to ask questions because you're here. I know you're interested in new email, newsletter building, so I'm sure you've got questions about this stuff. I am not the guru of email newsletters. I'm kind of a guide. So we're all on this journey together, so hopefully I can get you up a few steps in that journey, share with you some data tonight, share with you some case studies and some links and resources and so on. So hello to you wherever you are in the world. Thank you for joining this UpSchool webinar. It's 9 p.m. in Tokyo. Wherever you are in the world, good evening, good day, good morning. For the next 30 minutes, we're going to look at email newsletters. If you haven't already set up yourself, subscribe to next week's webinar. There's the link. It's going to pop up again later on. If you don't miss it, get yourself a seat at next week's webinar because next week's webinar, we're going to take this a little bit further. I'm going to tell you about the subject in a minute, but to now, right now, up school, it's all about newsletters, and importantly, how to get your first 500 newsletter subscribers. So what we're going to do tonight, look at the five key questions that people ask, entrepreneurs ask about newsletters. In particular, you know, some of the mistakes that entrepreneurs make when building newsletter lists and talk a little bit about next week, and then we're going to have a Q&A session. And this is live, right? I'm here, right here, right now. This is not pre-recorded. You know, I'm, I'm going to screw up. I'm going to do it right in front of you. So enjoy the ride. And that means also that you can ask me questions. If you have any questions tonight, just throw it in the chat box. I see some of you have already got used to the chat box. If you have any questions, anything, throw it in the chat box. Down there on the bottom left, I'll do my best to answer those questions as and when we go on, or we'll do them all at the Q&A session at the end. So why email? Well, the thing is, I know I've just come out of a session actually where we talked about, and this was a mastermind session, we talked about selling stuff online, and one of the mastermind members was talking about using Facebook to sell online. And we also looked at Facebook, compared it with email and so on. The fact of the matter is, is that even in this era of Facebook, of Snapchat, and all the different kinds of social media out there that you may be familiar with, Email still is number one when it comes to selling because there's something unique about email that other social media aren't able to do as well, and that is that email can build a relationship. You know, when you get somebody on your list, you can build a dialogue with that person over time. You can take them on a journey, and that's very difficult to do. You know, when they're on Facebook, they're looking at pictures of cats or whatever, but on email, you have their attention and so on. So email is so effective. I mean, let's look at the data here. Um, this is a survey done, it's a little bit old, it's a year old, but it says what is the most effective lead generation tactic? And by far, survey of 300 marketing professionals, by far the most effective tactic was email marketing in terms of generating leads. Um, compared to say for example paid search or online advertising, this also wasn't necessarily the most difficult either. So email marketing is effective. It's established. It works even in this day and age of social media. It still gets people's attention and trust, and that's what it's all about. Those are the two commodities that we're after, guys, as entrepreneurs. So if you have a look, I'm not going to make this all about data tonight, but I'm just going to throw in some data at the beginning so you know that I'm not bullshitting my way through this. You know, This is actually established science. In terms of channel ROI ratings, getting a little bit technical, but in terms of return on investment marketing for uh, email or for any kind of uh, marketing, what works most? Email marketing was the most effective. Sorry, a bit crazy there with my pen. Email marketing was the most effective in terms of return on investment. So, you know, for every dollar that you put into email marketing, you're going to get more return on email marketing than you would or from other forms of marketing, compare that to SEO, content marketing, paid search, etc, etc, right? So that's the case for email marketing. We know that. 
there's the science right there in front of our eyes so we know that we're not sort of just thinking you know gut reaction we're not just kind of bullshitting our way through this stuff right and what's really interesting and this is what I want to focus on today when it comes to email in terms of growing your list as well this is really interesting this survey done just under a year ago asked email marketers what their top priorities were for 2016 and it's interesting that the top priority which is really in line of what I want to talk about tonight was it's a little bit difficult to see let me just see if I can make this screen a little bit bigger um, the top priority was increasing subscriber engagement so that's what I want to talk about tonight engagement 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 is key to growing your list and I know a list is all about quantity but quality is absolutely the key tonight because if you have a look down here at the bottom it says uh, you know for example deliverability costs opening times personalization that kind of stuff you know the technical aspects of email marketing weren't so important the absolutely number one priority for marketers was engagement so we talk about what engagement is because that's absolutely essential when building your email list because even if you build a list of 500 I know people bound around figures of thousands or millions in their list but honestly if you have a list of 100 engaged people that's so much more valuable than a a disengaged list of five or ten thousand people right so the key is to build quality here and not be put off not be seduced into trying to go big with your list but trying to keep it deep and quality in terms of the relationship so that's really what we want to focus on so we'll have a look at list building tonight we look at everything from your call to action box to the autoresponders what I want to do is show you very simple stuff how to set this stuff up and how to use some of the, the plugins for example that are available out there on the internet um, how to segment your list and so on so a little bit technical tonight but you know if you're here and you're interested in email hopefully you're on the same wavelength right so but I do want to keep this simple because you know if you want to win the game of email you've absolutely got to keep it simple this is one of the most famous emails of all time sent by Barack Obama nonetheless apparently but this was before his uh, 2008 campaign I think and it just basically said hi I need you with me on this one I need three dollars or whatever you can right here's the link let's go Barack that was the email sent to everybody on Barack Obama's list and it worked. It's one of the most effective emails of all time in terms of raising money, in terms of sales, in terms of revenue generated, right? That was the email that got him into the White House, right? And have a look at that email. This is the email that got Barack Obama the most powerful job in the world. It's what? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven lines. So if there's one thing I want you to take away tonight in terms of building your list in email marketing is that quantity is not the answer it's quality you can become the president of the United States with a seven line email if you pitch it right if you do it the right way and that's what I want to talk about tonight keeping it real simple keeping it focused and quality engagement so let's start at the top if you're building a list the first thing you need is a lead magnet so let's talk about lead magnets what is a lead magnet um, well let's have a look at some examples this is a lead magnet you know you've been on plenty of websites where you see this kind of thing I've got this on my website these are everywhere right basically a lead magnet is where you get somebody's email address in return for something right now no matter who you're targeting people won't give you their email address unless you give them something in return and there's there's a couple of reasons for that one is because that's what people accept, expect expect they expect you give them something for free and secondly it's also trust building because not only are you giving them something away you're also having an opportunity to build a relationship with that person right so don't just think of this as oh i've got to give them an ebook to get them to sign up that ebook could be a fantastic sales tool for you, right? And you don't have to give them just, you know, a hundred page ebook. You can give them a one page, uh, what we'd call a content upgrade, which could be like a PDF that sits in a, a, a very specific post, right? So, you know, if you're doing a post on SEO, you could give them an SEO cheat sheet, 
write a one page PDF. These are very, very effective lead magnets, right? People expect you won't get any email addresses unless you give away something. Lead magnets could be a PDF, could be a video, could be extra content, could be access to something, whatever. But you've got to give away a lead magnet if you want to build a list. So very basic examples here. You want to learn WordPress? Free resources. You don't have to give away a PDF. Free resources could literally mean a one-page Word page document with a list of links in it, right? It could be something as simple as that. That could be your lead magnet. You don't have to write a book or a novel, right? You're not writing a trilogy here. You can just give away one page as long as it's really specific. Here's some other examples. Neil Patel come up in our conversations today in the mastermind. Neil Patel is the master of SEO. And one of the things he's really good at is this. If you have a look at his, um, this is his sort of call to action box, right? What really works about this? Look at this page. Why do you think this really works? There's a couple of elements here which are worth thinking about when you create a call to action box on your lead magnet, right? The first one is you have this big smiling face here, right? Now, there's a reason for that. People trust people. People buy from people. If somebody sees a face, they trust it. This is not the face of a spammer. This is not the face of some crook who's going to resell your email address, right? Maybe it is, but it's less likely to be because this guy's got his smiling face. That he looks kind of trustworthy. We trust people. People identify with people. The second thing as well, and this is probably the least known part of it, is this part here. How to generate 195,013 visitors. Now, this is if you've ever read any of Neil Patel's stuff, this is very typical of him. And it works. It's not how to generate 200,000 visitors. It's not how to generate lots of visitors. It's not how to generate visitors. It's how to generate 195,013 visitors, right? Very, very specific. So when you read that, the first thing that you assume is that's an actual figure. Why would he make this up? It sounds very scientific. And there's no reason why you can't make up a scientific number like this, right? So, you know, it's a very tangible benefit. So if you are offering a lead magnet, think about the very tangible benefit. You know, you can increase your X 27.7% or you can get an extra 42,013 whatevers, right? Very tangible benefits. People trust tangible benefits. Here's another example. This is from uh, Noah Kagan who developed the app Sumo series, which is a plugin that you can use for WordPress. But again, have a look at this. Very specific, get access to 85% of my best business hacks. That's really interesting because most people would just say, get access to my hacks, right? Get access to my business hacks. But it has this number in here. And as human beings as sort of creatures who are bombarded by lots of information when we see numbers we automatically focus on the numbers that's why a lot of the most successful headlines are the seven best x's or the ten top y's and the reason is is because when we see a number we associate that with something very specific right if i just say get access to my business hacks I could be offering you one hack. I could be offering you a thousand hacks. I don't know how long is this going to take. Is this a waste of my time? Am I going to open this page and there's going to be, you know, a surprise? There's nothing there. But 85% sounds really scientific and it sounds like a definitive number. I trust that. And in the same way, when we see headlines where it says the seven X's, we know that's a list, a defined list of content. And we know that seven, it's not eight or ten or one. We trust it because we, we think we know that's going to take a little bit of time and, you know, I can fit that into my day. So I will read that, right? It's not bullshit. It's not somebody trying to trick me, here, right? So if you also break this down a little bit here in terms of setting up your call to action, it's worth looking at how this was done. What internet marketers would be called benefit-driven call to action copy, right? So 
one of the problems we entrepreneurs have, especially the technological amongst us, is we focus on features, right? So if you're selling a product, here's a product, and this product is some kind of widget, right? And it does this, and this is why it's great. But the problem is, is that when people land on your website, they're not looking for a widget that does this. What they're looking for is something related to their problem. Right, so let's say somebody relates, lands on your website and their problem is skin care, acne. They're not looking for an acne cream. They're looking for information about acne and how they can solve it. And it just so happens that your acne cream could be a solution. But when they land on the website, what you're seeing them is not your features, not your product. What you're seeing them is an understanding of their problem. Okay, if you can feel their pain, they will buy from you time and time again. So, in this case here, it's benefit driven. He says, you know, you'll learn exactly how I started a two million multi two multi million dollar businesses, grew a seven hundred thousand plus email list, and where to find the best tacos in the world. Bit of humor, but it relates to the benefits that people are looking for. People want to know how to build a business, how to make money, how to become successful. All right. So that's what they are getting in the benefit. He's not selling the product which lies behind that, which will be his apps and his books and so on, right? So you've got to understand that when people land on your website and you get them onto your list, you don't sell your product. You talk about their problem and what their hopes and dreams and fears are, right? That's where you get them onto your newsletter. So let's move on. Um, I'll skip this. Data. I'll come back to this a bit later on because I, conscious of the time, I want to give you more time to ask questions about this. Right. Let's start at the basics. Right. So you want to set up a newsletter. We understand that you had to have this call to action thing. We understand that you have to have some kind of lead mag lead magnet. How do you actually set this thing up? Right. Um, and we're talking about setting up an opt in or call to action box. Right. You can create this stuff looking something like this. Very very simple. This would be something you can create on the website or the service lead pages which i have used this would be called a lead page on lead pages there's also lead boxes which i'll show you in a minute um, this is a landing page um, and a landing page is something which uh, you need to get familiar with if you're not already familiar with basically it's a web page which you land on coming from outside the website and the specific character of the landing page is often there are no links up here. Uh, so, you know, you don't have any option but to click this one big fat button here. Um, there's a lot of science behind landing pages, you know, what works, what doesn't work. This stuff has been split tested and tested many, many, many times, right? You know, very, very clear um, titles at the, at the top, exactly what you're getting the hero image on the left hand side and then the action box on the right hand side often you know three clear benefits above that right sometimes people would add some kind of social proof like you know the faces with testimonials and stuff like that underneath um, but this is really all you need on the landing page okay and this works these convert I know you see these everywhere and you think oh it looks a bit spammy but these actually work you know, you can get very high conversion rates with this kind of thing. You can get, you know, a good conversion rate with really depends on the kind of traffic that you are targeting. But, you know, the, you can get five, 10 percent conversions on this stuff all the way up to 40 to 50 percent if you're targeting a predefined list where you have a relationship with these people. Right. So that would compare with, say, one percent on a, a standard website which is not a landing page with a, a, an opt-in box in that right so landing pages are very very effective so how do you create this stuff right I want to talk about using Thrive Leads um, which is a plugin which I use for WordPress I used to use lead pages and I spend five hundred dollars a year on lead pages it's about forty or fifty dollars a month I think so I just bought the the annual license on that, about 500 bucks a year. But then Thrive Leads came out recently, and that was about $100 for the plugin. It's kind of expensive for a plugin on WordPress, but it's a one-time payment. And unlike lead pages, 
you know, that's an annual subscription, right? So it made sense. If it did everything that lead pages did, it would be a better investment than uh, lead pages. So I want to show you a little bit of um, how it works. And I, what I'll do is I'll just try and share my screen with you now to see if this works, right? So um, what I'm going to do is just share my page with you so you can have a look inside Thrive Leads. Um, let's wait there set this up. I'm going to show you a page inside uh, a website which I'm using. I don't actually use found uh, I don't actually use Thrive Leads on this, but I've set this up on founderfm.com just so you can see this. I use Thrive Leads on upschool.io. Uh, but just to keep this thing real simple, I've just set this up new today just so you can see it. So what you should be seeing is a dashboard for Thrive Leads, right? And what I want to show you is how you can set up a call to action box very, very quickly and get this set up on your website, right? So you have to be familiar with WordPress for this to happen, right? So, you know, if you're not familiar with WordPress, um, maybe it's worth going back and getting setting up on that platform first. But let me just show you very, very quickly what you do. What you start off doing is by creating a lead group, and we'll just call this the webinar test, right? And a lead group is a group of all the different kinds of boxes and short codes and all that kind of stuff that you're going to create, right? So then you would create an opt-in form and it gives you options for the different kind of opt-in forms that you can use. And I'll talk a little bit about these forms because it's kind of important that each of these forms has a different function and a different effectiveness, right? So there's an in-content form, which is a like a form that actually sits in the text of your blog post. There's a light box, which is like a pop-up, which uh, you know will pop up, usually triggered by time, that kind of thing. Or if you try and exit the website, it may then pop up. A post footer, again, like an in-content, but at the bottom. A ribbon sits at the top of your website. Sometimes you see it, there's a, a service called Hello Bar where you may just see a red strip at the top of your website. It just says, you know, it's a simple bit of text, enter your email. And they, they work very, very low conversion rates, but they all operate on high volume. Screen filler is something that completely box up your screen and you can't get past it. And you have to just say, give me your email address or no thanks, that kind of thing. Annoying, yes. But it works, absolutely. And don't worry about annoying your visitors. I know this sounds crazy. People say, I don't do this because this is, really pisses me off, right? But your number one goal to people visiting your website is to get their email address. Because 99.5% of the people who visit your website, you will never, ever see again. So just get their email address and get them onto the newsletter, right? Scroll map is... Like a screen filler, you land on the website and it drops down. It pushes the whole website down and it comes down with an example that says, you know, sign up for my email newsletter. You can just click no thanks and it disappears. Slide in or widget, don't use those very much, all right? So there's many, many different types of options there, right? So I want to just do this screen filler as an example. Okay, so I'm going to create a form and it's going to give me templates that I can use to create this screen filler, right? And I'm just going to call this test screen filler. Okay. And now what I have to do is just edit the design and it's going to give me some options. Okay. So something real simple will pop up now. And you can just edit it as like a drag and drop editor. It's real simple. So it gives you some options of what you want the screen filler to look like. So I'm going to click something real simple. So I'm going to click this app one, choose the template, and I can just sort of edit the, the text and so on. Right. So find the best places to travel, explore the planet. Let's just assume that that was what my website was. What you then have to do is... The only thing you really have to do technical is you have to connect it to your email service. And you do that by clicking the uh, the action button. OK, 
connect it with a service. You need an email service for all this to work. Create a new connection. This will then connect with MailChimp, which is mine, which would be the API. Or you may be using other different types, types of um, mail software. So let's say I'm going to connect it to my UpSchool webinars um, service. Click Save. What well, that will then do is it gives me some options here. I'm just going to skip those. What that will then do is if I fill in my email address there, it will then put it onto the correct newsletter list that I have in MailChimp. Very, very simple. I can preview this just to make sure that everything's okay. So that's what my pop will look like, right? So how do you implement this? Well, let's save it up first. And we go back to uh, the the dashboard here, and you can change these. You can change the triggers and this kind of thing, which is kind of important to get this right. So I'll just spend a minute or so on the triggers and and display frequency when it comes to doing your your pop up and so on. So the trigger is you click this, and it gives you options for how this will trigger. You can show it on page load. After a certain period of time, blah, 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 you've got all these kind of options, right? So what I'm going to do is, just to get this to work, I'm going to do it after five seconds, all right? You can have this thing called Smart Exit as well, which basically, that will trigger if somebody tries to exit the website. You may have seen that. If you try and move your mouse outside the browser screen, what then happens is the uh, the whole pop-up will appear. and It knows that you're leaving, so the thing will pop up and say, hey, don't go, sign up for my newsletter, and so on, right? So I'm going to click that. That should save after five seconds. And you can change this bit here. It says display frequency every seven days. If you set it at zero, it will be displayed all the time or 100 days or whatever. Um, there's no real sort of best practices here. Just keep it as what it was set every seven days, all right? Um, you can have animations and so on. All right, so that is ready to go. What I'll then do is if we go back to the dashboard, we can activate this thing. And you can decide whether you want to display this on uh, desktop or mobile. You may not want to display it on mobile for a number of reasons, like, for example, it doesn't look good or, you know, maybe... For whatever reason, you've got the kind of control that you have there. So if I can just put it on the desktop for now, um, and then we are ready to go. What will then happen is that pops up. Okay, if I gives me options where I want to display it, I put it on the front page, all posts, and so on. So I'm just going to put it on the front page of Founder FM just for now. So what I'm now going to do, so if I load this website up, Assuming everything's okay, the whole thing should come up. So there you go. Just try to exit the website. Try to click another tab, and this thing pops up, right? So that's now live. That took me, what, five minutes to set up? That's not bad, eh? You could set up something that like, looks pretty good, right? You could get something like this set up and you could start building your newsletter straight away. That's in five minutes, right? And you didn't need to do really any coding. Um, you know, if you want to go back and review that, I'll, I'll save the video. If you're a mastermind member, you can access that video, go back and review this. That was pretty straightforward stuff, right? So let's jump back into uh, where were we on this? Yeah, Thrive Leads. So what I've just done is I've shown you how to set up a, um, a call to action box, a pop-up that works. That's an effective pop-up because there's a screen fill. That's going to bug people to get their email addresses. And that, that took, in all, maybe five or ten minutes. So you don't need a lot of coding there. You don't even need to create a page for that because it will automatically trigger. Just remind me, I need to turn that off, right? before the end of this webinar because people are going to be coming to Founder FM thinking, what the hell is this travel thing now, right? So anyway, I'll do that. But remind me, please. Okay, I will answer your questions at the end if that's okay, Fraser. So just keep hold on that now. So we'll just we'll jump through these. So, okay, I've shown you different kinds of 
opt-ins and so on. Um, scroll mats, content upgrades, pop-ups, etc. Many, many different options. I think I've covered some of that already. Um, if you were to look at this uh, link here, I'll put that into the chat box as well. So you've got you've got a and you can click that and have a look. Um, it tells you all the different kinds of. Uh, if you scroll right down to the bottom, it tells you all the different kinds of uh, call to action boxes that you can use that are available that are commonly used and so on. Just so you can get an idea of the terminology, because I think it's kind of nice to know what people are talking about when they're talking about ribbons or inline forms or opt-in widgets and so on. Um, one thing worth paying attention to, and if I can just share my screen with you, just so I can show you this, right? Because I think this is kind of important. Um, there's a thing called a content lock, which I find very, very effective call to action box, right? Now, let me just show you what a content lock is. And to do this, I need to open up a new uh, page. And what I'm going to do is take you to Upschool and show you a content lock in action, right? So what a content lock is, is basically you go to a website and there's a bit of content in the website and it locks the content. And you can't access it until you give away your email address, right? So um, these work really, really well and probably the most effective um, Call to action boxes out there, but you've got to have content that's worth unlocking first at the beginning, right? So what I'm going to do is just jump into um, Upschool, and I'm going to do this with a a um, there we go. So this is on the home page of Upschool. If you haven't done this already, you just test this out, right? So on the home page of Upschool, what you have is uh, content, and then this box here, this lock appears. What you can do is you can wrap the lock around a certain aspect of your content and it will blur it out, which is kind of nice actually because when it's blurred out, your visitor actually sees what's behind it. It's kind of tempting. Oh, look, you know, there's a whole bunch of videos behind this, right? Um, it's not bullshit. I know these are there because I can actually see this stuff, right? But I've got to give away my email address for this. So it's a very upfront trade, and that works. That's highly effective. And you would, if you were to go into the training video section as well, I use the content lock on um, specific videos as well. Actually, just oh, there you go. There's another one there. So if you go into the, the training video section of upschool.io, it's really important to understand that in this game, nothing happens. What you actually see, let me just, that's actually talking at me now. That's, that actually is where you have a video which is locked, but you can't actually see the video. You can hear it. The video plays, but it's locked. So that's kind of frustrating for the visitors. They want to put in their email address to give you, um, give you their email address to get access to that video. So that's a really effective way of getting email addresses. That's called a content lock. Let me just end sharing here for the screen, jump back into the presentation. So if you're back with me on this page now, um, let's actually talking about how to grow your newsletter now. And one of the key questions that people ask is how often should you send your newsletter? I know this is sort of a big jump between generating leads now to how often should you send, but I think it's good to have a complete picture of where we're going with this. Um, very common question. You know, it's really interesting that if you segment your newsletter, and I'll talk about segmentation in a minute, that what you should have is a situation where you have active users of your newsletter based on people opening and clicking, and the less active members of your newsletter, the lurkers, the people who don't open, don't click, don't do anything, right? What you should do is you should try and get away from this once a week newsletter type scenario that everybody seems to accept as default, right? And take it to a situation where you give your active users more newsletters and you give your inactive users less newsletters, right? And there's a reason for that is because if somebody's inactive, then maybe they don't want to hear your message right now. But the key 
point what I just mentioned there is right now because at one point they signed up for your newsletter but now maybe they're busy you know life happens business happens family happens and people aren't interested in your newsletter right now but you've got them on the newsletter what you should do is just back off a little bit and just wait for when they're ready because when they're ready they then convert into a more active newsletter subscriber. They start opening your newsletters again and clicking and stuff like that. And when that happens, you send them more. Because it's so important when you're building a newsletter is the level of interest. When somebody signs up for your newsletter, the level of interest is really high. But it drops off real fast. Like after one week, half, two weeks, quarter, and so on, right? There's a half-life for their interest. If you don't get them straight away, if you don't engage them straight away, you'll lose them forever, right? So it's really important when that interest comes back and they're still on your newsletter, they haven't done anything for six months, you might give up on them, right? But just keep them on the newsletter. And then suddenly they get interested in what you're doing again. For, for whatever reason, they get interested in your thing again, maybe because of them, maybe because of your message, maybe a seasonal thing. We don't know. You know, life changes, things we don't have control over in their world, right? They get interested in your newsletter again, and then the interest, you wanna start sending them more emails, right? Because at that point, there's a window, and in that window, you wanna engage them, you wanna take them forward. So it, it's really important when you have a list is you start breaking that list down and segmenting it and engaging people and sending more to the people who are active and less to the people who are inactive, right? So let's talk a little bit about segmentation and how that works. And there's a reason why you should segment here. And this is a, a survey done by Lyris. Um, email segmentation results, it's spelled out here. You know, the number one impact of email segmentation on your list is, I don't know if you can see it right here, but it says increased, can I see that just a bit bigger increased open rates all right most effective way of getting people to open your email is to segment your list right so how do you do that okay what I want to do is just show you a very basic way of segmenting a list right and to do this I'll take you into my MailChimp account and I'll show you how I can segment a sample list very very simple stuff you know, don't expect rocket science here, but just very simple, just so you can understand what we mean by segmentation and how you can do this, right? So what I'm going to do is just going to share my um, screen with you again and take you into my MailChimp account. So what I've done is I've set up a test list here, real simple stuff. And... The reason why I'm showing you this is I can show you that you can segment a list even with two people in it, right? So what you should be seeing here is a test list that I've set up in MailChimp. Only two people in this list. Both of them are me, all right? But I want to show you how you can segment this list, right? So you've got this list, so this could be two people. It could be 2,000 people, whatever, right? Um, what you can do is you can go into the list settings and this will apply to any email software. We'll have this, right? Not just MailChimp. So if you use GetResponse or Aweber or whatever you use, it will have these settings, these list fields. So if you're familiar with databases, very similar. Right? That every entry into your newsletter has these list fields. So it has email address, first name, last name. What I'm going to do is I'm going to add a field, and these are completely arbitrary. I can add any kind of field I like. Okay, so I'm going to add this field and call it country. Make it not visible. I don't want them to see it. Okay, and then save the changes. Okay, so what now happens if I was to go back into my list? I can start segmenting these. So you can start getting this information when they sign up, or you can get this information and add it yourself or ask your email newsletter subscribers for this information. So in my case, for example, when I do these webinars, 
one of the real benefits of using the webinar software, it tells me what country people are in. So all you guys here tonight, when you sign up, I get your email address, your name, which is great because I know who you are, and then also your country so I can see whether you're in the United Kingdom or Japan or Spain or wherever, right? So what will then happen is, is when the list from the uh, webinars gets fed through to my MailChimp account, it will also tell me where all these people are, okay? So in this case, I've added Japan to this guy's entry, right? Very, very simple stuff. I mean, you could segment by many, many different categories, all right? I've just chosen country because it's an obvious one that we can do, but you could segment, for example, by what they signed up for. Did they sign up for the email? Did they sign up for the webinar? You know, what were they interested in? And so on. So the point is, is you're building a picture of these people and you can use that information to send them different kinds of messages. So if I go back to my list now, I've got two people in my list. One is in Japan and one is in Spain. So what I'm now going to do is I'm going to create a segment. Okay. So I click on the list and create a segment and every email software has this function, right? So it asks me how I want to create this segment. It's, so it says create a new segment where subscribers match any of the following conditions. And I want to find um, country. So I want to create a, a segment where everybody in that segment is in Japan. Okay. Preview that segment just to make sure. There we go. This guy is in Japan. Okay. So why would I do that? Well, there's a number of reasons why I might do that. One is, for example, that let's say I'm organizing an event in Japan. I don't want to be sending the guy in Spain information about an event in Japan because he's going to think that's not relevant to him. And the more irrelevant stuff that I send to him, the more he's likely to not open it and unsubscribe. So I only want to send him stuff that's relevant. So I can send a message, hey, what are you doing next Thursday? We're organizing an upschool event in Tokyo. Come along. Everybody who gets that message, it should be relevant to them, right? Because they're all in Japan. Okay, there may be different parts in Japan, but even if they're in a different city, they're going to be interested in what's happening in Japan. And vice versa, I could do the same for Spain. Or if I had content relevant to somebody of a certain type of segment. So if somebody signs up, I could then hit them with an autoresponder, which is an automated series of emails relevant to that segment. So if somebody signs up in Japan, I could then send them some content about, for example, hey, check out these stories about Japanese entrepreneurs. Not so relevant to the guy in Spain, but very relevant to the person in Japan because maybe the names are familiar. It's somebody like him and so on. So that's how you can segment. And that's how, going back to that data that we had earlier, that's how you get increased open rates. Segment, segment, segment. But don't overdo it. Don't do too much segmentation because it becomes irrelevant. Only do simple segmentation. And as your list grows, you can add in new stuff. But at the beginning, maybe just use one factor, segment your list, segment it by a you know, simple factor like geography, like I do. But you can also segment it by activity, which I do as well, which is highly effective. Okay, so before we hit the Q&A, Let's do this. Reserve your place for the next webinar. Next week, I'm talking about networking. How to network like a pro. Here's the thing, right? We entrepreneurs, we like messing around with computers. But if you want to be successful, you've got to get out there and you've got to get into the world, meet people, do the networking. I know computers is comfortable and easy and all that kind of thing, right? You can just sit here clicking away and I'm talking to you right now. But if you want to build a business, you've got to get out there. Even if you're building an app business or an online business, you've got to get out there. You've got to meet customers, meet partners, meet whoever it is, people, media. You've got to get out there and network. So next week I'm talking about networking. How do you do that? How do you use LinkedIn? How do you use Meetup? How do you use... You know, how do you create a following? How do you create an audience? How do you network with people? How do you build a list? That's ne next week, networking 
like a pro. How do you do that to build your business? Find partners, find customers. So it's free next week. So you'll be redirected after this webinar to that page anyway. But if you doesn't for any reason it doesn't work, sometimes it doesn't work on certain apps on certain uh, desktops and so on. That's the link. You know the score. You've been there before. Go and get yourself a place. I'll see you next week. But before we do that, let's do the Q and A. So rounding up, Q and A, guys. Um, Fraser, your first question. I have lead pages, but haven't really used it yet, and it isn't cheap. I'm within my 30 days, so can cancel for a refund. Would you recommend doing that and switching to Thrive, just to keep costs down initially? It looks really user friendly. Um, yes, is the answer to that. I would say that. Um, that's only from my perspective. That's what I would do. But you know, there may be certain features on lead pages that are not on Thrive Themes. That happens in all these kind of softwares. They all kind of very similar, but there's one thing that one has that the other doesn't have, and so on. But um, purely on the basis of cost performance, I think Thrive Leads is so much better. In my own case, um, you know. I've used lead pages. I've been using lead pages for three or four years, no, maybe four years now. So, you know, I know lead pages very well. I've spent a lot of money on lead pages. So, for me now to say, well, I don't need it anymore, I'm going with Thrive Leads is a big jump. So, yes, it depends how you're going to use it. I mean, if you are, okay, so let's just rewind a little bit here. Lead pages started out doing lead pages, right, which if I can just kind of rewind the whole thing back here, these things, right, simple one page sign up, right, that's what a lead page was when it started out, and then they started adding in all the lead boxes and all these kind of other functions, right, and now most lead pages offerings are all the different kinds of signups like the lead boxes lead links all this kind of stuff that it has going on right but i think if you just use lead pages right just the one page forms and that's all you do then maybe lead pages is better it's more expensive but it's a highly effective way of doing that but what i found is that you know I can't rely on lead pages alone. You know, most of my traffic goes to the blog itself, not to, not through two landing pages, right? So I find that our Thrive Themes, Thrive Leads, is a much better option for me. So, um, yeah, I mean, as a mastermind member, I, I'll show you how to get set up on Thrive Themes. Um, happy to to walk you through and demo it and all that kind of thing, right? And get you set up on that so not a problem easy to do that through the slack platform that we use at the mastermind so hopefully that answers your question you should save yourself a lot of money go ahead and cancel uh lead pages get yourself a copy of thrive leads and save yourself a few hundred dollars and you can buy me a beer next time you see me in return for my services saving you all that money but i also think it's actually a better platform the difference between thrive themes and uh, lead pages is lead pages is hosted on lead pages so it's a little bit slow so sometimes you know when you're editing it's really you know it's quite frustrating trying to edit stuff and you, you know the server's slow and so on thrive themes yeah carahilo would do great that that will satisfy me thanks fraser all right moving on any more questions just throw them into the chat box akos question Good man, Akos, always with the questions every week. Thank you for being an active member of this presentation webinar. Plain text or well-designed HTML emails, which one is more effective to, according to my experience? Um, yeah, that's a really good question. Um, my kind of emails are like, they look like plain text, but they're HTML, if that makes sense. So you receive my emails, so you know what they kind of look like. They're real simple things, right? I mean, let's go back to the beginning. Most effective email, one of the most effective emails ever was this one, right? The Barack Obama email. Um, I think what it tells us is that 
the importance of the quality not the design the importance of the message the the context rather than the content if that makes sense so the importance of what it's actually saying here rather than how it looks i mean if it looks shit then obviously it's more difficult to say the message but if it looks okay i don't think having a great design will make much difference it's important what you're saying right um i don't know i mean yeah, I mean, images convert better. I'm not sure if that's true. Um, it depends, right? It really depends because if you send an email, and there's okay, so there's a lot of email templates, right, which are very complicated. It's quite, it looks like a website, and people send you this stuff, right? Maybe that would work for certain types of, like, for example, if you had a big shop with lots of content in the shop store right if you had lots of products in the store send that kind of thing that might work but if you're selling it something else is a lot more simple I would keep your email simple that would be my advice keep your email simple it's better to start okay I'm, I'm sort of trying to think out the answer here because I use something quite plain but what I can see where you're going because you're selling a product um, the answer would be start simple and then grow your email okay so if you can get people engaged with simple emails that's fantastic you can then build up the images and the text and the design as you go on it's a lot harder to start with a well-designed HTML email and then try and get the message right if that makes sense so start with a basic email and then build it up rather than go the other way that's how I would do it because you know, the real important thing about email ACOS, and this applies to everybody, is your ability to test the email, to split test the email, right? So it's really hard to split test an email if there's many, many factors in it, right? So, you know, when I send an email, what I usually test is just a few simple factors, like, for example, the title or the send time or the length of the content so titles really easy a or b send time tuesday or wednesday that kind of thing the content could be seven lines or 20 lines right if you then put in the complicated html email you've got many other factors involved you know like colors and layout and all that kind of thing images so it becomes a lot harder to test your email my my answer to your question would be test it. If you want to put it to the test, test it. Test a plain email and test a HTML email. Which one wins? Because you will get the results, right? Those results are more informed than everything I've just told you now. Okay. But however you want to do it, start simple as you say. Great. Let me make sure uh Vipal. If you have an ebook or PDF in mind but aren't a domain expert, what approach is best? Reach out to freelancers, get a virtual assistant or research, and do it yourself. So I'm guessing you're talking about uh, a lead magnet, right? So you're thinking about a lead magnet to get people to sign up to your email list, and, and you're asking me whether or not you should write that yourself or you should get somebody to write it for you, etc. So yes, um, if you have the ebook in mind, what is the best way of doing it? Um, okay, so well, it really depends. I guess you know. I don't know what the subject you're going to write about. Maybe you can tell me. Um, share it with us. But here's the thing: Are you going to enjoy writing twenty pages on that subject? Okay. If you could do that now, if you could stay up late and knock out a 20-page ebook, which importantly is honest rather than accurate, that's a really important part about lead magnets is that you know you don't have to be an expert, you just have to be honest, right? So but I'm sitting here with you now, I'm not an expert in lead generation. 
but I'm honest. I've shared with you, you know, I gave you access to my website. I, you know, I shared with you some examples. I tell you what I know, what I don't know. I tell you what worked, what hasn't worked, and so on. Right? I'm just being honest. Right? Um, I know something, and that's worth sharing. I've got some experience. Right? And it's the same with you. If you write an ebook, can you write 20 pages and just be really honest? Whatever your subject is. Let's say, for example, your subject is bike repair. I don't know. Maybe it is repairing bikes you may not own a bike shop, but you may have experience in repairing bikes just share that experience with us if it's interesting if it's human if it's something we can connect with write it yourself right however if your subject is quite technical right let's say you're for example you are um, offering some kind of ebook about nutrition very very specific nutrition and you want to sound quite scientific and technical, then maybe you, you can get somebody who knows what they're talking about to write it if you don't, right? If you're not going to enjoy writing it, it needs to be quite scientific and technical and so on. But anyway, jump forward a little bit here. Um, when it comes to writing ebooks, honestly, my advice to you would be try and start really small. You know, can you write a five page ebook? Because you know what? Five pages work. I'll show you an example. Um, let's go to. I'm going to show you a real simple, a very effective way of getting people to sign up, which may just be one page, right? I mean, how about that? That's pretty cool. If I can share that with you, that could probably save you a lot of time. And it's called a cheat sheet, right? And we talked about this earlier in the mastermind in the earlier mastermind sessions so that's come up again but it's great that we're now talking about this so what I want to do is I'll share with you my screen um, I want to show you how you can avoid writing a really long ebook and save yourself a lot of time and money potentially but still get lots of people to sign up sound interesting well if it does then check out what I'm going to share with you so I'm going to go to Neil Patel again once again Neil Patel our old friend um, pops up and um, what I'm doing is I'm sharing with you a web page which is about on-page SEO right real straightforward subject but very defined subject on-page SEO right and scroll down here see this here this little yellow box it says doing on-page SEO for your website you may find this on-page SEO cheat sheet useful Click that, simple sign up. Now, that on page SEO cheat sheet is one page long, right? And the reason why that really works rather than, you know, look, look at the sign up box. The sign up box is real simple. It's not like I've shown earlier tonight, right? It's not like a graphic or anything like that. It's really, really simple, but these are really, really effective. The reason why this works is relevance, right? This is called, in internet marketing terms, a content upgrade, right? So here's the content. Now you can upgrade that content with this little, little bit of extra. People like to go a little bit deeper. They're into the zone about on-page SEO. So if you give them something more, they're going to give you their email address right here, right now, right? These are highly effective. So going back to your question if I may where you asked me um, you know what works let's just scroll back to the Q&A section here you asked me if you have an ebook in mind but you know don't know how to get it done or just kind of going through the options here what I would consider do doing Vipor is looking first at content upgrades so let's say you've got some content Let, I'm assuming you've got content right if you have content you can start throwing upgrades into that simple yellow boxes boom one page one page one page and you know what you could then build an ebook out of all those different kind of content upgrades so let's say you had 10 pages on different types of content you could then put those 10 pages together and create an ebook all right which could then be you know if you get people onto your list Let's say you've got 10 pages covering different parts of content relevant to what you're talking about, each one with a specific relevant upgrade in it with one page on it. Get people onto your list. When they get onto your list, you could then do is say, hey, look, you sign up for this. 
do you want to get this ebook for free? And that's another freebie that you can give away to people on your list, which keeps people engaged and also will increase your sales down the line, right? So my advice to anybody here tonight is rather than go out and create a big ebook, um, look at creating first and offering upgrades or offering content locks, which I've showed you here tonight. I mean, I started in my website, every ebooks, um, ebooks, a lot of effort writing an ebook. Um, and, you know, there's, there's a problem with writing ebooks is that once you create the ebook, it's very difficult then to go back and change the ebook, re upload it, all that kind of stuff, right? But if, if you do create content, and what I did was I, I was creating video content and locking the content, and that is more effective for me than getting people to sign up for ebooks. So, very, very simple. I don't need to go back and write, in, you know, I need to create this big ebook, keep changing this thing all the time, want to add in new stuff and so on. Um, I found that works a lot more effectively than me, and content upgrades as well are far more effective ways of getting people to sign up. So I would start there. Start. You know, that's been the message tonight. Start real simple. Start real small, and upgrade yourself from there. Whether it's content upgrades, you know, writing your ebook. Start with a one pager if it's valuable. Start with that one page, or whether it is building an email newsletter. Start with a real simple newsletter rather than a, a fancy newsletter, and so on. Or you know, just sending out your message and keeping it real simple, like that Barack Obama email. Hey, wow, well, guys, we've overran tonight. We've done six minutes. Great, thank you so much for your participation and your challenging questions. Kept me on my toes tonight, and hopefully that was useful. If you're a mastermind member, you can download the video and the presentation tonight. Um, if you're not a mastermind member interested in becoming a part of a community of entrepreneurs, a global community of entrepreneurs, go and check out upschool.io slash mastermind. You'll get access to a whole bunch of content. You'll get access to all the other mastermind members so you can share and grow, help each other grow your business, a support network of entrepreneurs. And every single webinar that we do here will be recorded for posterity and for your own learning purposes and put onto the Upschool Mastermind Slack platform so you can access it as well as the download from here tonight. So hopefully you got some value out of tonight and you learned a little bit about building your email newsletter. Message takeaway from tonight is start simple and build up from there. And hopefully we're all on this journey where we can get 500 newsletter subscribers together. But if I show you like tonight, for example, how you can set up a, a, a call to action box in five or 10 minutes, it shouldn't take you that long at all. Guys, I'm really looking forward to seeing you at next Wednesday's webinar. Once again, we'll be rocking. We'll be on top form. We're all about building your network next week. As I hit the end event button, hopefully it redirects you to the next webinar page so you can go and reserve your place. Once again, it's free, so there's no harm in just shoving your details in there and reserving your seat for next week. And hopefully you rock up and challenge me with some tougher questions next week. I'm looking forward to it. Have a great week, guys. See you at the next one.